All right. I think we are actually live. So welcome everybody to uh, this um, event of uh, Chaos Zero to Hero, where we have uh, quite a few people actually lined up for you guys. Um, before I introduce all of them, because there's a quite a few, I actually want to um, mention a few things that might be of interest to all of you. Uh, the first thing is that we have a Chaos Campus on Facebook, the Chaos Campus Facebook group, which you should definitely join. Um, this is a newer-ish initiative from Chaos for especially new people into the industry to get some great help from industry professionals. I'm there myself as a mentor as well. Uh, we have a lot of great people there, which you probably already know through Chaos as well. Um, it's a, it's a really great time, so you should really go look for the group on Facebook, Chaos Campus, and then definitely join that. Besides that, we have a call for content, um, which is a form on the Chaos website that uh, where they would love to receive your work, uh, including architecture, interior design, renders, product, motion graphics, animations, uh, and so on. Um, for this year, they're um, for the first time, they're planning to do a student showreel. So if you share your work, you might be uh, lucky enough to get featured in the student uh, showreel. Um, I will post the link for the submit your art link for the Chaos website. Um, definitely go and, uh, and have a look at that and um, be sure to, uh, if you have anything to show, uh, make sure to submit it because it's a great way to uh, maybe get a bit of... Um, you know, attention and uh, to get your work out there and get people to notice you a little bit more. Besides that, you can get, um, we want to get some feedback from you guys when we're done with this show as well. Uh, we'll probably mention this as well, um, but we're uh, expecting to send out a, um, we'd love to hear from you guys what the next editions of Zero to Hero could be about and so on. So depending on how this will uh, goes, you know, we'll, um, we'll be happy to know uh, how that all that works out. Um, we also have a trial link for you guys. So if you want to try out any of the Chaos software, we have a um, link here, which I just shared in the chat, where you can uh, get a free trial for 30 days on either uh, V-Ray for FreeDS Max, Maya, SketchUp, Rhino, Revit, uh, Cinema 40, Unreal, Houdini, Nuke, and all that, that jazz. It's also for uh, Phoenix, for FreeDS Max and Maya, Maya uh, Chaos Cosmos, Chaos Scans, Chaos Vantage, Chaos Player, everything. So, you know, go check it out if you haven't tried any of Chaos' software yet. Great. So that was a bit much, but hello. Uh, my name is Niklas. I am the founder of Chaos Theory, a YouTube channel Chaos Theory, where I do uh, content for mainly beginners, but eventually also for, you know, hopefully also for all the experts out there. Um, I also do, uh, I teach at 3D College Denmark um, where we do mainly ArcVis, but we actually have a lot of different student, students. So we also do uh, game dev and um, sorry, VFX and you know, all of those great things. Um, with me today, I have, let's see, we have Jake Denham, who's a 3D artist and tutorial creator at Chaos Corona. We have John Luke Hodgkins, which is founder and creative director at Another Artists. We have Bennett O, content creator and architectural designer at Archihex. We have Ivailo uh, Kovachev, which is associate director at Red Vertex. And we have Davide Paolini, who's founder at 3D Graphic Academy. Um, he's not live here today, but he does have a presentation that he would like to share with you guys, which we will be coming at later. So without stalling much more, I actually would love to introduce you guys to Jake and let Jake take over from here. Remember to unmute yourself, Jake. All right, are we ready? You can see my screen? All good. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about a few things I wish I had known when starting out in the world of 3D. I am a 3D artist and tutorial creator for Chaos Corona. And before that, I worked in yacht design 
And I've also worked in 3D visualization studios, architects, um, as well as freelancing for a variety of clients. I've also been sharing what I learned since 2011 through my blog, YouTube, and some courses. So today we are going to talk about how I got started and where is the work. So I'm from Cambridge and you probably know it for its universities. Um, unbeknownst to me, when I was growing up, I was dyslexic. So I had quite a hard time making my grades in the traditional subjects. So I leaned quite heavily on the arts. And I wouldn't say I was particularly gifted at it, but it is what I spent most of my time doing. So I naturally got better at it. And when I left school, I took a double A level in art and design. So this was a little bit of everything. It was fine art, life drawing, screen printing. And this is Long Road Sixth Form College where I went. And this is the art quadrant. And this is where I studied and created all sorts of things. And one day I stumbled across a small room in the corner of this quadrant. And it was full of colorful computers and they were Macs. And there was this man called Larry. And intrigued, I asked Larry, what's going on in here? And he told me that this is the computer graphics lab. And this is where I got my first exposure to computer graphics in the form of Photoshop. And I couldn't believe that I could scan in hand-drawn work and I could add filters, I could liquefy things and I could change the color and I could make many versions of the same piece. And this was really cool. I was really impressed with the scalability um, this was really appealing to be able to scan in one drawing and get 10 out, especially for someone trying to post, pass their A-levels. So all of this combined with the ability to undo multiple times, I was hooked. And when I say hooked, for my 18th birthday, I got RAM. And then for my 21st birthday, I got more RAM. But what's better than two dimensions? Three dimensions. So I made the decision to study game art and design at university. And I think that I was one of the first year of students to take that course. And um, I'm not sure if this was reverse psychology from my tutor, but she said I wouldn't get the grades to study game design at uni. So my first thought was I'll show her. So the, at college, the actual lesson time for the A-level was like six hours a week. Um, so I just started going in nine to five every day I could. And needless to say, bumping my working hours from six to 40, I got the grades and I went to uni. And I think this was a big lesson in if I decided on doing something, committing the time and kept turning up that I could do it. And then I got to uni and we learned 3ds Max and we started using Unreal as well. And all the UIs were gray back then. And uh, this is when I started thinking about how video game technology could be applied in the real world. And I always remember this friend telling me with great pride about how he was the mayor in SimCity and he was building stuff and how he'd uh, make this virtual cash and then spend it and build bigger cities. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I could design stuff in virtual world and then it would get built in the real world and I'd get paid real money. And it would probably take the same amount of time as I would spend in SimCity. So I decided rather than playing SimCity, I'd try and make things in the virtual world that would get built in reality. So since then, I've helped design planes, yachts, hotels, homes, and shopping malls in the virtual world that have been created in the real world. And looking back, it's really easy to connect the dots and think, well, that all worked out really well. Um, but in reality, most of the time I was wondering how I was going to earn money. No one knows what 3D visualization is and I should probably get a real job. And what I found is being a starving artist is overrated. Um, so here are a few things I wish I knew when I was getting started. Um, the best thing I did was create and post work online. And I moved to Brighton after my degree, which was about 10 years ago. And there was this VW camper van and Vespa show where enthusiasts would come and they'd show off their vans and their bikes. And I took some pictures for my blog and then I modeled the camper vans and I posted it online on Coraflot, Autodesk area and on my blog. And I also sent it to 3D World magazine, Expos, and they published it. And then Area put it on their homepage. 
And a fun fact is um, the camper van is still on the 3DS Max homepage. And it was also in this month's 3D World magazine. So talk about longevity. Um, and then this guy called Berkeley message saying he'd seen my work on Coraflot and asked if I was interested in doing some work for them. And uh, I started doing some interior work and it turns out Berkeley was head of design for Palmer Johnson Yachts. And I eventually moved to Monaco and I stayed with a team there for about four years. So starting a blog was one of the best things I did. And it was somewhere for me to document my journey. And the majority of the posts are for me to refer to um, how to do something later on. But the work I was creating was for no purpose other than to just create and post. And looking back, I think I could have been more strategic. If I was starting out again, I'd pick a few companies I wanted to work for and then start creating work based on their, uh, that wouldn't look out of place on their website. So imagine when you send in your portfolio and your work's already in line with what they do, um, I'm sure that they would be keen to have a chat. But all of this takes time and where do you find time? As I said at the beginning, I never thought I was naturally gifted and I always felt like I was trying to catch up and I knew I had to spend time developing my craft. So I'd schedule time in the calendar. Um, and I don't, if I hadn't done this, I don't think I would have developed the work or the skills I did. Um, and this is really useful if someone says, do you want to come to the pub? I can check my calendar and I can actually be like, sorry, I've actually got something on. So where are all of these people with the jobs? Um, I found that people with similar passions tend to like to hang out with each other. And in my experience, places like meetups, conferences, they're great places to meet people with the same passion. And at the end of the day, people hire people. And if you're gonna spend all day with someone in the studio, you wanna first make sure that they're a nice person. And then you wanna make sure they're passionate about what they do. And the fact that you're at a conference demonstrates that. And finally, you can be taught software and workflows. And these conferences also give you an opportunity to meet studios and make sure you actually wanna work for these people. But I know it's not easy getting to conferences, especially in the last few years. Um, but I definitely don't recommend sending out loads of cold emails or LinkedIn messages. Um, no one likes cold emails unless it's about inheritance from a long lost auntie. So when I started freelancing, I did something called 10 by 10. And if I didn't have a client on, I'd ring 10 people before 10 a.m. And that's like call them on the phone. And this meant I'd open up the yellow pages and this was like the original internet. So each area would have a directory of companies and you'd have like a list of architects or interior designers. So this can be really real scary to do, um, but I think it's good for you. It builds your confidence and it gets you explaining what you do. So starting at A, I'd, at the beginning, I'd be like five, four, three, two, one. And I'd call them and I'd say something like, Hi, my name's Jake and I make 3D images and I was just calling to let you know I exist and wondered if I could send over some examples of what I do. And they're only really gonna say yes or no. Um, and if they say yes, you can ask who to send it to, get their email and you can ask what their name is and then you can put together a nice email um, with some examples of your work and send it to the right person. So I found that people respected the call over a cold email and we got to talk so imagine if they sounded really mean would you have wanted to work for them anyway um, it also gives you an opportunity to ask questions and them and uh, this worked out pretty well for me but if you're going to do this then um, I've already called all the A's and B's so start with another letter so to summarize commit time and keep turning up Create and post work regularly, attend conferences, meetups, or even start your own, and uh, try to reach out in person first, even if it's by phone. And that's about all from me. If you want to learn more about Corona Renderer, then you can check out the YouTube channel, and you can find me in any of these places if you want to get in touch. Um, thanks very much for listening. All right. Great. Thanks a lot, Jake. Um, 
Actually, you're talking a little bit about this um, cold calling versus uh, cold emails. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying cold calling, for those who might not know, that's a reference to when you call a company who doesn't know you yet at all, if that didn't you know, make sense from, from how, you, how you said it, which is fine. I actually do believe that there might be some rules against cold emails now with marketing directly to companies, uh, uh, which you know, it's supposed to be there, at least in the EU, as far as I remember. Um, so maybe be careful about that. If you, if any of you guys listening in thinking that, oh, I'll just do the email part instead, because that's easier or, you know, um, not as direct, because it can be pretty intimidating to just call up a company, which you do not know at all, and just introduce yourself. Um, but it's definitely the way to go as far as I know, when it comes to actually the law of marketing as well um so that might um it's a it's a great idea and it's great to actually hear and see someone do it that way um did it go as well as you t told us in the beginning or oh, it did wasn't, it take time no no it took a lot of time um yeah. and as well just to get confident on the phone and yeah i mean half the people will just hang up or tell you where to go um but then, you know, it's nice to chat to people. And a lot of people were like, oh, this is like the first time anyone's called um, and they were keen to talk and it worked, you know. For sure. All right. We will come back to uh, Jake as well later on. So if you do get any questions and we haven't uh, brought them up yet, just um, make sure to write your questions and I will bring them up later when we've been through a few more artists uh, or of the speakers. So um, please uh, keep that in mind. All right, so next up is John. John Luke Hodgkins is the founder of Creative and Creative Director of Another Artist. So John, it's your time to shine. And remember your microphone. Hey guys, how are we doing? Um, Jake, I kind of wish I knew a lot of that stuff when I was growing up in the ranks. That's great stuff, cheers mate. Um, so I'm John Luke Hodgkins. I'm here to just show you guys some how, where I started and what I'm doing now. Firstly, Huge thanks to oh, uh, Nicholas and Chaos for having me here today. I think I can show you some stuff and it's kind of helpful, fingers crossed. Um, so firstly, I'll start off uh, in the beginning. Um, I was kind of known as art boy at school because like back in the day, I was a, a ute and I used to just love hand drawing and sketching. And I could just like see something and just like replicate it. I don't know why it was this weird kind of talent I had that my parents obviously loved. Um, and they probably exploited a little bit, but um, I didn't find like a, my true passion in terms of like originality with these hand drawings. So as I got a bit older, I went to fine art school and I started expressing my um, ideas and stuff and using different medias, uh, practicing with many different types of paint, gouache, acrylics, um, found expressionistic abstract. And I was like, great, this is, this is what I, I love doing and I'm, I'm happy and I can actually create Kind of my artwork that I love that makes me happy and I was like well what do I do with this where you know what can I turn this into don't really want to be an art teacher so I thought architects push the boundary of art so I thought I moved to Oxford and study architecture at architecture school there and um, I kind of found myself doing similar sort of work from my fine art days you know kind of using color and balance and you know all these kind of interesting things I learned at art school and putting them straight into my architectural ideas and designs. And, you know, this, this for me was like really cool. So I was learning this kind of software, self, self taught, obviously at school, they taught us to do hand, hand drawings, which um, I didn't really, I couldn't really explain myself very well. Um, so I kind of relied on CGI to, to do that. So I thought I'd learn as much as I could as quick as possible to, to not have to do too many presenta presentations and you know, show off my work verbally. I just kind of put it on the screen and said, look, this is my ideas, what do you reckon? And came up with some pretty interesting ideas. So after school, I was like, well, what, what shall I do with this? I love art, architecture, design, creativity, products, furniture. So I started creating, creating these kind of explorations of like ideas and spaces. And um, <laughs> these, are, these are years old, so these are trash. And I accept that, but I'm kind of, happy to show them off. Um, uh, I'm hoping this is not my best work. But, um, you know, back in the day, I was kind of coming up with these ideas of like furniture pieces, where I see something, I want to copy it, kind of like creating these little 
installation sort of product visualization spaces and was like, oh, there's something within this something interesting about this you know and using my architectural understanding of composition and lighting and texturing in a very basic way so i was like great let's let's kind of push on this and and see where this takes me and end up getting me through my university days i met quite a lot of mates and stuff and i was quite lucky because at that school it was all about kind of drinking and socializing and i didn't know where any of my mates would go at the time because it was all you know uh, morons i guess at that school just partying but a lot of them ended up doing some really great things and kind of put me up with uh, job applications and freelance and i end up going from doing this kind of fine art to like product visualization into actually doing like these kind of more high-end product spaces and interior spaces um, and these kind of pushed to bigger interior sort of spaces and architectural projects. Um, so then I was quite lucky because where these sort of projects kind of got the attention of um, people like Hayes Davidson and uh, Squint Opera, where I was lucky to get like kind of moved around the globe working in like Melbourne and New York and stuff and doing any sort of imaginable architectural project, you know, under the sun. Um, and I, I loved it. I was super happy. But I kind of was so far away yet from this point from doing the, the artwork that I, that from as a, as a young, uh, as a kid. So I thought, well, how can I still do my artwork and my architecture stuff and my creativity? And, you know, how can I blend it all together? What's, you know, where does this all go? So I kind of started doing on the side all this kind of weird, interesting, terrible work like this which I found out later on to be like NFTs, but I was doing these sort of 10 plus years ago, just to try and experiment and practice and look at different ways of doing things, looking at lighting, animating, and, you know, they're all very, very embarrassing, but I love them. Like I wouldn't change it for the world because these have helped me kind of learn exactly where I wanted to go or how I could use my, you know, previous education and go somewhere with it. And, you know, for that, I'm super thankful for, for putting myself in a position where I was constantly learning, you know, beyond after working hours or at school, I was just trying to experiment with software. Um, so this is all done in, I think, mental ray or V-ray. Um, so this, yeah, I think all these projects are mental ray or V-ray. I can't say any, no, yeah, that's correct. Um, so then from this, I thought I'd start another artist and we're a visual art studio focuses on architecture animation and the effects and environments and uh, digital artwork. Uh, we worked all around the world and I thought, okay, I want to be very diverse and like a broad range of projects. So from my architectural days, I started getting jobs like this, which is this really cool photographers in France. And they said, look, we've got this space. We want to put a Jeep in it. I was like, cool. Okay. Where do you want the Jeep? Oh, I want it, you know, off, off the picture. To the left, I was like, well, you know, then we have to start turning this into a 3D space. So this is where it all kind of started for me to get actually start getting the clients on board from all came from architecture. So then I'd have to turn this, you know, photograph into a 3D space and then put my Jeep in. You couldn't just photo montage and camera track and match camera match the camera, um, the, the space and put the, the car in. It just didn't wouldn't work because they wanted to see more of the left hand side. So it was actually easier just to 3D model the space. Um, this, this is great when a client knows exactly where they want their product, but sometimes the client has no idea where they want the product. They say, look, we've got some really cool furniture. Can you just invent somewhere? And I'm like, yeah, sure. It's, it's 3D. That's, that's what we do. So it's, it's quite nice being able to do both. And then sometimes people are like, oh, can you do exteriors? Like, we've got a similar sort of idea. We've got, you know, blurring the lines between art and architecture. We've got this kind of sculptural place. Um, this is at LA Ram Stadium um, in Los Angeles, and it's like it's an outdoor kind of structure that we want to showcase. And it's like, yeah, great, we, we can do that because it's again 3D, we can do what we want. Um, so this started to attract more artists, which is exactly kind of what I wanted to do. It was like pushing from all my architecture sort of understanding and career, I'm pushing more towards you know getting the attention of artwork and fabricators and structural engineers and trying to create these massive um, you know kind of uh, pieces. And being involved with that so i had this other artist um in new york who said look i've got this kind of moon idea it's beautiful moon it's all perforated and it's it's like the shape of a moon you can touch it it's rough um and we want to sit on like a hill somewhere i said oh, that sounds great hopefully i can i can help out with this um but then he said actually what we need to do to really sell it is we found a location for it so we need to put it in location 
Um, I was like, oh, cool, that sounds good. Where's the location? Oh, it's off the west coast of America, but it's not built yet. So, not, so at the moment, all it was was water. So they asked me to create an environment, like landscape for it. So I ended up creating this like, mini city to, ho to home this, uh, this, this sculpture for them. And I ended up doing like 12 images of this made up city. And it's, it's just being able to be flexible with the type of work you do and trying not to turn down work in terms of like, oh, I've never really just made up a city before. And then throwing yourself right into the deep end and just going ahead and doing it. So then once you know you can do kind of the photorealistic city stuff, you can try and push the boundaries a little bit and be like, oh, maybe I can make a more, it looks photorealistic, but maybe it doesn't exist anywhere. So then you're, you're kind of coming up with worlds and inventing things. And then the purpose is to showcase the product because the client's interested in marketing the product, if it's architecture or furniture or whatever it might be. We just, I, I tried to put myself in a position where I was available to come up with this sort of, uh, you know, work. Um, and then I was, I was looking at this image and I was, I was really happy with it. But then I thought, well, does the image itself become a piece of artwork? I got reached out by another artist who had this idea and they wanted me to put their beautiful purple sculpture in this kind of architectural environment. And then I, I was looking at this, these compositions of lighting and the texture. And I was like, well, actually, these are kind of, it's like inception, it's like artwork within artwork. Like we're showcasing the, the design of the, the client, but also the, the work itself could potentially be like some sort of print that you might put on your, your wall sort of thing. Um, so it's like, you know, playing around with all these different possibilities. Um, but then because of this sort of sculpture, I got asked to actually start 3D printing sculptures and I, I'd have to be physically given an idea. For example, this artist asked me to put a bag over some people's heads who are trying to kiss and then like as if you're pulling it away. I was like, yeah, sure, I can come up with that. And they were like, we want a file though that we can send to the printers and get printed in bronze. I was like, okay, that's, you know, it's new, let's do it. Um, and then to top it off, they said, oh, we need leopard print all over it. So I was like, well, actually, that's quite difficult because in, in 3D, you can just do things as textures and unwrap them and it's easy because it's just visual. But this had to be literally an indent, like a, a you know, kind of Z brush pattern that you needed to paint out of this sculpture. So when it hit print, it comes out exactly like the render. So by not limiting myself, I then got the attention of like, these kind of basketball players wanted the same thing and now they're printing their arms and you know basketballs and stuff and their heads in chrome um which is mad uh, but this all came from architecture um, and then the way i lit them and the environments of the scenes like it's it's all aided towards the kind of end goal of working with these artists but then it goes back to architecture with working with people like apple uh the, the headquarters in san fran they they worked with myself and an artist to come up with this kind of sculpture for their welcome center. So, um, you know, the, the artist came up with this idea of playing with scale and texture and color using old school Apple products and, you know, just arranging them in different sort of relationships. And then I was there to help aid, aid the process of, you know, selling this to Apple and saying, look, this is what you want. Um, it's quite funny. Originally, this project had, it was, I don't know if you guys have been to the Apple headquarters before, but this area in front of the um, center is is covered in olive trees and they expected me to paint out about six of them and place this in the in the position and then and then you know call it a day and i was like i'm gonna have to do this all in 3d in order to to achieve that because i'm not cutting around loads of branches so in the end they didn't understand why i had to do it on 3d and until i showed them a 3d environment whacked a camera around all over the place and just hit render to show you the actual potential of every single possible angle and lighting and, and they loved it and they kind of blew their minds a little bit the um so so it's like such a handy handy tool to have and then this kind of gets the attention of other other things I'm, I'm really hoping this is not the best image in the deck because this is not quite done by me it's done by some architects in amsterdam but basically this was working with jeff bezos um where he and the artist asked me to showcase a sculptural product for them that's going to be hanging in, um, in the new headquarters, the Amazon headquarters in DC. So this is an in insane, crazy, fun project. Um, it gets really arty, which I love, but um, I feel like I need to be like, uh, okay, I'll try and explain this. So the idea is between the moon and the tide, where that relationship where, you know, the, that kind of the moon pushes the tide and it's, you know, super dramatic. 
they wanted to do the same thing because he's a billionaire wanted to do the same thing but with maybe a satellite so we thought we'd send a satellite into space um and that kind of orbits the world uh bear with me so there's it, it goes it orbits around the world and that did that kind of depicts on how the art piece kind of rotates so as the satellites go around the world um this you know kind of orbits and then at night time it projects some of jeff bezos favorite paintings on it because of the shape of it they get very well distorted so i think then jeff said it'd be great is have, as the solar system goes around the world it goes to certain coordinates and then it plays back into the headquarters music from amazon music here say jay-z you know the satellite is over you know new york and it's just this insane kind of project um but then you know you know it's kind of blowing the lines of the ancient art and architecture it's perfect sort of place i want to be working in and then it kind of changes a little bit where you think oh what else can you do with with these kind of architectural projects and this was working with the National Gallery of Art and Google on this, um, with this dancer who would be eventually controlled by like a person's kind of fingertip movements. Um, so that kind of tells her how to move her body. So firstly, we had to rig this character and make a model her, and then we had to model the space um, for her on the on the artist's sort of painting. Um, and it's it's like how she moves throughout the space and what sort of space that looks like and the colors used. So then the final product is is this. Um, it goes on for longer, but this is just a snippet. Um, and I just realized this is a really weird clip to to use, but anyway, it's it's it, that's what it is. Um, so it's luckily by doing all that research back at school and and doing all those sort of explorations, I've now put myself in a position doing the exact type of work I wanted to do. So. This is kind of one of the most recent projects we're doing. It's just the VFX breakdown um, showing from the, the project we're doing. They've got these characters and we've created these 3D scenes for these characters. And then we've rendered them and textured them, lit them. And then um, we've got the characters and we've got the green screen them and filmed them and then cut and rotated them all out and then copped the backgrounds in and done some final post production on them. And you know, all this comes from architecture, which is insane. But we're super fortunate that we worked so hard. Well, I worked so hard to try and, you know, use my architectural experience and then do all this other stuff, which I find fascinating and super, super cool and fun. Um, so what I'm going to do is just finish off with my show reel, and then I think I'm pretty much done. So um, if you guys have any questions or you want to ask me how I did things or anything like that, or just, I don't know, want to chat, I don't whatever, check me out, um, Instagram, another artist, and, or anotherartist.co, my website, or just send me an email, hello at anotherartist.co. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Cheers. All right. Thanks a lot, John. That was amazing. Um, so before we actually move on, I actually have a question, um, which you know, any of you guys, if you want to uh, join in on the on on the old question. Um, so it seems like one of the um, common things that both uh, you, John and Jake talked a little bit about is, um, you know, getting, getting discovered, getting your work out there, getting someone to notice you, how would any of you guys uh, if you have any uh, advice to, especially a new artist, how would a new artist get, you know, discovered when you have basically no platform yet, or 
um, how how could you you know how do how do you get that exposure which seems to snowball off you know client projects and so on for a lot of you guys obviously um, but what if you're what if you started from scratch how would you go about and do that if any of you have any insight well for me I I first worked out exactly the type of artwork I wanted to do and the type of creative talented you know individuals and stuff I wanted to be working with so then. I spent a lot of my time um, just engineering that sort of work or exploring that sort of work that I wanted to eventually turn into profitable projects. And um, then once I had them, those projects that I was pretty happy to share with the world, I just punched them all over Instagram, um, social media, and you know, put yourself in a position where you can take on, I guess, competitions or, or collaborations. Like um, I, I think. I was kind of lucky in the sense that back in my day was obviously there's loads of events and I used to just go drinking with people. Um, and I'm sure that's going to come back, but I never found myself ever going up to anyone asking them about 3D. I always just, you know, if I got introduced to someone, it'd always be just kind of banter or like uh, having fun. And then eventually they, they get to know you as a person, then hopefully they'd want to work with you. You'd be like, oh, actually, maybe you should share like details and, and, and show each other like work and how we can collaborate together. Um, I never tried to push it as like, oh, this person is so important. I want to go work with them. Let's go ask them about a plugin or script. Because I found most people I knew didn't want to hear. They went in a pub to learn, like talk about like scripts and stuff like that. Um, so best advice is just do the work you want to create as a professional career. And that will eventually attract the companies that want to employ you to do that, hopefully that same work. And now there's so many companies out there creating awesome, awesome work. I'm sure, you know, most, most of the time, you can fit into one of these sort of categories in terms of what you're producing, if it's architecture, if it's advertising, VFX. There's so many opportunities to, you know, punch work towards these individuals or individual companies. I just uh, I suggest, yeah, just go away and make it in any sort of time that you have. Cool. Does any of uh, you other guys have any uh, anything to add on to that in terms of, you know, getting getting discovered? Yeah, submit your work to the Chaos Students showreel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't even mean I didn't even mean to make that plug, but yeah, great, great, great mention, Jake. That is actually not a bad idea. Is it's a you know any opportunity to get your work out there, which can get pushed by a company or um, a YouTube channel. Uh, like Bennett, I know you have a lot of followers on your YouTube channel, for example. But obviously, you'd had to do something to in order to get to that point. So how how did you manage? If you know, uh, how did you manage to get discovered? Uh, you're muted. Nope, still no audio. <laughs> All right, we'll try and uh, see if we can get Bennett to uh, fix his audio, audio in the main, meantime. Um, so one of the things that I tell my students, actually, when it comes to um, getting some exposure uh, would be through um, other things like the Rookies, for example. The Rookies is almost uh, done now for this year, actually. Uh, I think it ends uh, in five, four or five days or something like that. Um, so it's a bit short notice now to uh, make any entries if, if none of you have. And obviously it's for students as well. Uh, so if you're not a student, if you're, a, if you're not a rookie anymore and, and you're still trying to figure out how to get exposure, there are a lot of other competitions and, and other things like the rookies. So, you know, keep an eye out for, you know, collaborative projects, uh, stuff that can, so you can basically latch on to others and try and, and, you know, take a little bit of advantage of that and get some exposure through other channels that already exists, um, which could be something like the rookies or uh, CG architect or, you know, any, any kind of things like that, that might get, you know, some a judging panel to actually uh, get to notice you a little bit. I've, I've heard so many great stories of young um people in this industry getting noticed by a company and the company reaching out to them and actually offering them jobs, even though they didn't win the competitions themselves, but because the judges, which represents all of these companies, ends up seeing a potential for these um, students as well. 
So that's a that's a, another great way. All right. So this is a little bit awkward because the next speaker is actually Bennett, but um, Bennett did give us a uh, pre-recorded um, presentation, which I think we could probably start with, and then hopefully he will get back on in a second. Um, Bennett is content creator and architectural designer at ArchiHex. So let's see what he has to say. Okay, hello and welcome to this talk. My name is Bennett from ArchiHex, and needless to say, I'm super excited to be a part of this talk. So thank you, Chaos, for inviting me. And um, today I'm going to be talking about things I wish I knew before I graduated from architecture school. Now, there are three lessons I'm going to be talking about. And I believe that if you do all these, you're going to make the most out of your school and um, you will have no regrets looking back. And, um, for those of you guys who are not in school and not planning to go back to school anytime soon, you can still probably find a way to do this from your workplace as well. So hope you guys will find this interesting and let's dive right into it. So number one tip I wanna talk about is that you should go out there, try different things out and don't be afraid of failing. I know this sounds a little bit cliche, but I completely understand how difficult this is because number one, as a student, I find that it's a little bit hard to kind of go out there and do something different because you're afraid of judgment. And the other thing is that as a student, it feels so easy to feel like you're gonna do something wrong. And this is completely fair, you know, I was just there, you know, several years ago and um, it all makes sense. But in retrospect, what I wish I would have done in school is actually the opposite. I kind of wish that when I find something that was interesting, I feel like I should have just dug deep into it and stay my ground even when I face a little bit of pushback from the desk crits and other professors because at the end of the day what you're left with is your work and your process and your portfolio nobody at your workplace or grad school really cares about what other people you know thought about your project or what kind of mark you got on each of these projects at the end if they see that you have the potential to become a great student or employee, that's all that really matters. And in order to develop all these characteristics, you really have to invest in yourself. And that is exploring what you think is interesting and dig deep into it. Now let's think about a scenario. You are following the curriculum and suddenly you find structure really interesting. And then what I would advise is apply structures to everything that you're doing. Like create a crazy cantilever building for your studio project and do some extra research on top of that. And before you know it, you become an expert in that field and it will propel you to learn a lot more than you would have originally done had you just followed a curriculum. And another example is like, let's say you're super into rendering, then I'd say just go for it. Create the most beautiful visualization you can possibly make for your project. Maybe your professors hate it. Maybe they're super traditional, but if this is what interests you, I'd say go for it. And at the end of the day, if you create something that is truly interesting, they will have to give you points for that one. And a part of it is like negotiation and convincing, but all those things aside, at the end of the day, you should feel satisfied with the projects that you're spending months designing. Now let's move on to number two. Number two is that I shouldn't be too afraid of being not original. I know like designing can feel like an exercise of creating something original, but that could actually hinder you from being original. I know this sounds like a little bit confusing, but let me explain. Buildings and architecture has evolved over thousands if not tens of thousands of years. And if you try to invent something completely original, like without no background knowledge whatsoever, you're, all you're gonna invent is a primitive hut, stick and frames. That's all you can do within your lifetime. But if you open up your eyes to learning from other peoples and examples, you'll be able to fast forward thousands of years of learning. So what should you do instead? So if I could go back to architecture school, what I would first do is go to references. 
So let's say my project is about designing a mixed-use building in an urban environment. There's hundreds, thousands of examples of this kind of building. So I would run down to the library or open up ArcDaily or other websites and look up mixed-use building and just consume all the knowledge and the, all the examples that you can find and take note of things you find is interesting and leave other things that you think is less interesting. And if you find room for improvement, awesome! This is how you become original. So start collecting all these little references that you like and uh, you think are cool to try and then bring them into your site and your project. And of course, you shouldn't just copy and paste the whole building into your site. That's not how we should do it. Always put your own twist to it and be inventive. And um, steal like an artist. So that is lesson number two. Now, last but not least, so this is about sharing your work. Now, as a student, I was a little bit hesitant about sharing my work. I feel like I put so much of myself into it. I don't want to like get judged by other people. And worst of all, I don't want people to copy my work. So I kind of like hid them away. You know, I only show it to a couple of my friends and then, you know, I've done all that. So it all completely makes sense. But let's think about it this way. Buildings. Ultimately, what we're doing is to build buildings. And buildings are meant for sharing. You know, unless you're, of course, designing maybe something like a prison. But even prisons, like the tenants change. So it's meant for sharing. In the end, if something gets built, it becomes public and everyone can know about it. So if you think about it this way, you know, what's the point? You know, what's the point of hiding things, right? Once you start sharing your work and what you think is like very interesting about what you did, you'll be surprised how quickly other people will also open themselves up and you get to kind of peek into their own ingenuity as well. So as opposed to someone who's bottled up all their know-hows and interesting tips and tricks into their own corner, they are sort of like frogs in the well. And on the other hand, if you start sharing and build a community of people who share their tips and tricks and all their ideas and designs, you will realize that you will quickly push each other to new limits and take each other to a new level. And then this is a part where I kind of want to talk about my personal story. After graduation, I started this YouTube channel called Archihacks. And on the channel, I shared videos about tutorials, knowledge sharing about softwares such as Rhino, Photoshop, and Illustrator. And at first, it was a little bit slow, but down the road, I was able to connect with tens of thousands of subscribers and got reached out by really famous companies such as Archetizer, Chaos, and Epic Games. All these companies I wouldn't have even imagined collaborating with just a few years ago. And all this happened within the span of just a few years. So I'm like looking forward to what's going to happen down the road and really appreciative of what has happened so far. And that being said, I think you should really try this yourself and experience this magic of sharing. And as a finishing note, I wanted to talk about Archive, which is a website I co-founded with people that connected online. And this is a website where you can share your work with other people around the globe. And this website is specifically designed for architects. So hope you guys will find it interesting. Go check it out at arc-hive.com. So that being said, hope you guys found these lessons useful and um, try implementing a couple of them during your education. So to recap, first off, don't be afraid of trying new things. Dive deep into what inspires you. And number two, don't be afraid of not being original. Learn from other people, study precedents. And from there, you can also find what inspires you. And then number three, share your ingenuity and then people will share them back to you and then we can all collaborate help each other to make the world a better place for the future so that's it for today thanks for tuning in and um hope you guys enjoy the rest of the talk today and i'll see you guys next time bye all right did we actually managed to get Bennett back or did he uh, disappear? Oh, he is here. Does yeah, can, sound can you hear me now? Or? Yeah, we can. Great. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a horrible timing, but I think my video sort of answered your question. So uh, was there any outstanding question that I missed? Um, 
Not that I noticed so far, but I think uh, I actually do have a few questions that I think will fit you as uh, really well as uh, as well. But I think we will get back to that when we uh, when we've been through a little bit more of it. But that was a great presentation as well. So uh, really interesting story, and it's amazing to hear all of these just so far. We even we we only had John, Jake, and Bennett so far, but you know it's a great difference into you know how getting into this world even though it's the same we're all ending up in Aquis somehow and 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 yeah i think that's a that's a great way to see all the different approaches you can take to get into an industry in itself so that's great all right so next up however is uh ivailo kovachev who is associate director at red vertex so i believe ivailo has some things to share with us Hi everybody, uh, mic check one, two. Can you hear me guys? Okay. So as uh, Nicholas uh, mentioned, my name is Ivalo. I am 33 years old. I'm at the position associate director in Red Vertex. Uh, I have been working here for the past 10 years. And uh, I just like to share my story so far in the field of 3D and if somebody can take something from it, if you find it inspirational, I'll be more than glad. Really, really great work from the other guys too. It was so interesting for me. And uh, my approach would be kind of more mixed technical stuff with philosophical stuff and with the decisions I took so far. So let's just begin. As you can see, taking way back, that's me some 30 years ago uh, in the small city of Asenovgrad in Bulgaria. It's about 50,000 people. And uh, it didn't have any environment for me to dig in and create inspiration and take advices in the world of arts, but I was really interested in that. Once my grandmother bought her first computer, like I think it was 99. Um, soon after playing a lot of games, uh, I wanted to make something new and I discovered the world of Photoshop. So this is how I begin my artist uh, adventure. It was creating skins for Winamp. If you guys remember that before the Spotify and YouTube era, um, message boards and forums, we used to have these avatars pictures. We were creating those as well. Uh, desktop backgrounds, anything uh, I can imagine to just able to modify, to test some text filters, photo filters, anything. Um, so, as I was growing old uh, as a teenager, um, I didn't really know what career I want to pursue. I doubt anyone knows before it gets he gets he or she gets to high school, but uh, I got into a school of electronics. Um, that really wasn't my thing. I didn't want to be an electrical engineer or something like this. Not that there is something bad with that profession, but it, it just didn't really click with me. So I just discovered uh, working with Photoshop. Um, I even got my first job in senior year. That was my last year in high school. I just stopped going to school. <laughs> I took maybe several weeks there. It was a full-time graphic design job, nine to five. It was in a shop for skateboarding and surfboard and this kind of stuff, uh, clothing. I was making designs for clothes and I really like it. I really liked it, but uh, that didn't work out. Uh, I had uh, college exams coming in and uh, the approach of the company itself wasn't really my thing. So I graduated and I got into a university with marketing. So nothing in common with the electronics so far. But I still didn't stop working with graphic design. That was really what all through these years from like I was 12 or 13 years old and so on. Now that I'm 18, 19, going into university, still doing graphic design stuff. 
and um, I find I find this internship, as you can see in the second bullet, that was a free internship in the marketing sphere. I was in my third year, and um, I applied for it. They got me, and other than marketing, I, I wasn't expecting anything else. I thought, wow, if I can be one step ahead of all my colleagues that don't have any experience, uh, that would be really great to have this kind of advantage. But they also uh, appointed me to do some graphic designs, like the design of the diplomas, banners, web elements, and so on. So I was combining both. And later on, they got me full time. I continue working, mixing with the school. I, I started to get paid. And I wanted to invest in buying myself a laptop. So that was a very major decision to get kind of a better computer because it was at this time my girlfriend got into architecture school, but in Sofia, that's the capital of Bulgaria. So she started learning architecture and I was still in Plovdiv. Um, this really motivated me because I always had a thing for interior design and I tried to decide this uh, software called 3ds Max. I started looking for some tutorials. I started doing tests that I'm not going to show now, right now because most of you will just disconnect. And I, I kind of liked it. Uh, the idea of having another dimension is really interesting. So I started rendering. I started watching a lot of tutorials. It wasn't so many back then. This is like 15 years ago, maybe. And I was in university during the day, then at my graphic design job. And later at night, I was doing test renders. And uh, OK, it was a pretty nice computer for back in the day, but it wasn't still able to hit render and just see your results 10 minutes later like you can do now. So I was hitting render during the night, go to sleep, and pray that I got all my settings correct when I wake up in the morning, sometimes just to find out that uh, the program crashed, no render, nothing at all. But uh, to trial and error, I got better and better and um, was confident enough to start showing my renders on forums. The one you can see in the lower left is some of my first interiors that I was doing. I was still using Mental Ray and I just couldn't get them to look more photorealistic. I couldn't uh, make them without with, with less noise with better settings i was trying everything i was asking in the forums they were saying increase this setting decrease this one and so on and so on until one day i discovered the world of vray so it has nothing to do that this uh, event is sponsored by chaos it really the way it happened and really in a matter of days and weeks i just uh, feel this this ease of work Everything was so intuitive. I was getting better and better results. And uh, I got to the point on the render on the right. Uh, I was getting better and better to that. And I remember vividly one comment, like all the guys on the forums were trashing me, like you're going nowhere, maybe stick to marketing. But it's, um, I think, really important to just find your passion and just go for it. And no matter all the bad critics, and by that I don't mean people that will learn, that will teach you about how to do something, but the ones that are just basically haters, you just have to ignore that and be inspired by that and motivated by that and just keep doing what you love. And there was one uh, message that I remember saying, a new 3D giant is coming after this series of uh, renders I was doing with V-Ray. So I was in between photography, graphic design, web design. I was still learning marketing. And when I started reading these positive comments, I really thought to myself, maybe, maybe this is a career I might have a future in. So little did I know back then. Um, I started doing freelance. I, I got better and better. It was this website, freelance.com. Maybe some of you know it. And in the lower left, you can see that was my first uh, commissioned work that I got for a client. He wanted this for a web background to use as a, as a template for his website. 
and this is the the first money i made solely based on 3d and i i really enjoyed that i didn't have how to get my money i was making paypal accounts i was asking friends how to get this transaction and so on and so on and freelance really uh, has its pros and cons i know a lot of people that are doing only freelance and i know people of course that never tried it i tried it for several months i got several gigs here and there in the, the 3d part but um, i wanted more stability you have the freedom but uh, you never know when the next gig is coming out. Sometimes you have a lot of work, sometimes you may not. And um, I was uploading everywhere, message boards, Vimeo. The one on the right is uh, from a video I made of this free work I did. Uh, it, it was a breakdown and just showing, starting from sketch to the wireframe, to the test render, raw render, post-production. And I just created a video sequence of that. Next thing you know, I receive a message on Vimeo and it's from the owner of Red Vertex, the company I work in now, Dimitar Rashkov. And he said, how can I contact you? I want to talk with you. We have an opening in the studio because back then it was like 20 people working in the company and there wasn't any free workspaces available. If you want to come in, someone had to quit or be fired in order for a free space to come up and then you you can apply and start so at the point i had a steady job finishing university and waiting to get graduated as a graphic designer it's been like two or three months but i said okay let's try let's go to sofia i was still in plovdiv um, let, let's try and go there and hear him out i went to the studio on a saturday it was just me and him uh, and a guy with a Mike Tyson face tattoo. So this was the first person I saw in the office. He was doing some extra work. I said, some place here. Uh, it was an old apartment with vintage furniture. It was very nice stylized, there renders everywhere. First time I walk in an office like that because in Plovdiv, there weren't any 3D companies or available jobs for me. It was only what I could find with graphic design and Photoshop. So we talked for a while. I said uh, how I feel. He said what we can propose. And uh, I, was, I was thinking in my head that I want this job, but I had this fear and, and that I share with him. Um, I had this steady job. I have to come in a much bigger city, start, quit, quit the old job, find a new place to go and really risk it because I haven't worked that full time so far. And he realized that what I was feeling, that I was not so sure if I want to take it, maybe some fear in voting. He said, you know what? In life, you, you just got to be brave and take your chances. And when the opportunity presents itself, just grab it and go for it. We didn't close the deal back then, but in the back of my head, I, I made a, my decision. I go back to my work as graphic designer, said I was going to quit in like two weeks time and started, work, started looking for a place to stay in Sofia. It was like my morning routine, drink my coffee, or open the website and find any listings. I find the listing, go back to Sofia, check it. First thing I saw, I took it. It was like, a, it was I actually not bigger than the room that I'm in right now. It was like 15 square meters. Actually, you can see it in the lower left. Uh, the fisheye lens I have used for this photo really gives a wrong impression. It is much smaller in person. Um, I'm told 188 and the bed was like in a uh, caught, in, caught in a ship. It was sunken under the, the roof. And this was my first place I stayed. It was not very convenient, but I was doing it. I started in Sofia. I started in Red Vertex. And that was maybe my, my biggest step that I took in my professional career. First day in the office. It's all keywords around me, all great artists. We were working from 10 to 7 p.m. back then. And it becomes 7 p.m. I say, I'll make a good first impression. I'll stay up till 7.30. It comes 7.30, nobody's leaving. I said, so people are really giving a lot of extra effort. And I was the youngest one. So every day I start staying up later and later and later because I was, I was the newest guy. I had to catch up with all these great artists around me. 
and it's uh, really important to ask questions. Some people, maybe they are shy, maybe they have bigger ego, but you have to ignore all that and just ask questions. If you don't know how to do something, how to model something or render it, just ask a question. Don't be afraid for it because you spend three hours and losing time if you're up in a deadline. Just ask questions and it may be someone less experienced, but he may be able to give you an important advice. The second bullet says sleep um, because I didn't sleep uh, a lot when I was making 3D. I don't want to sound like I was the only one like doing that. But even before I got in the company, I was the, the passion was so big inside of me that I, I didn't feel the urge to sleep. I was making render tests like four or five in the morning. You, you, you have to, to find that passion in your life that will be able to keep you all night to, to learn the craft because you just won't come, come up so naturally. We, in the field of 3D and artists and so on in design, uh, we are lucky enough that no specific diploma is required, like for a lawyer or a doctor or stuff like that. You, you can learn it by yourself, but no one is going to put it inside your mind. You, you have to spend in the hours, you have to put in the time. And even after I started working full time, there were times that we had to render during the night, stay during the night. You just go on the couch for one hour, then come back to the workstation and continue doing this just the way it is. The things have changed back then. I don't want to scare anyone that uh, maybe maybe decides to apply here, but it is how the, the stuff was about then. And nobody really complained. There were some guys that quit, but as I think of it, from the 20, 30 people that were in the company when I started, uh, most of them are still here. And yeah, that was my first workstation in the upper right. And uh, really cool hats as a interior design touch. My work and the variety of it really comes to these, uh, these two. The, the interiors on the right are actually my first project, my first renders that I did 10 years ago. It was an animation. Um, I, I didn't do any animation so far, and it was my first thing, but uh, I managed it. I made the interior shots. Uh, I can't show the animation right now because it's confidential, but these were the renders and uh, everything went great. And I feel I felt uh, the satisfaction that uh, I was able to tackle a new problem, uh, an uncharted territory that was really something new for me. And the one on the lower left, is uh, showing the much, much advanced uh, period of my time. This is the famous Dubai Marina uh, district with all those skyscrapers in the back, the tallest uh, ferry wheel in front in the world. And uh, this is just the, the contrast in my work. I started as someone who is mainly focused in interiors, but everything from stadiums to Arabic heritage, souks, to shopping malls, all kinds of projects throughout the world. And it's really a blessing that I can do my living with something that started with test renders of interiors. Um, it, it, it's really a, a wild ride. Uh, our, our company is separated into teams led by project managers. And uh, naturally, I wanted to become one. It didn't happen in the beginning. I had my fair share of unpleasant talks of things I have to uh, make better about myself, to give more effort, uh, some non-technical stuff. And I really just stopped uh, do, uh, looking at that as a single purpose. I, I just started to give more as an employee, to come on time, to stay late, to, to make more, um, to, give, to give extra, to participate in different uh, scenarios, to take more responsibility and just several years later, without me knowing it, I, I was promoted to a team manager as I am to this day. And um, it's really a different ball game. It's still you are doing everything in 3D, but you have just to find a balance between what are your team members doing and what you're doing and how you're going in the same path if you're meeting the deadline. It's uh, it's something that I really joined. I, I have my management classes during university, so that really helped a lot. And uh, 
yeah worldwide the first bullet as you can see how to get big clients is what people nowadays call clickbait there's no exact formula on how to get bigger clients and uh, when i started like two three years in the company i went to my boss Dimitar and told him i was like feeling super confident already got some years of experience under my sleeve and just told him okay uh can we just uh write an email to the biggest guys to Norman Foster or the biggest architectural companies and just let them offer our work. And he described to me that it's not with it's not the way that uh, with these companies, not the way to proceed, you have to be suggested by someone you have to accumulate more connections, you have to gain more experience and you just can't go and propose yourself to the big players like this. Um, naturally, over the years, one thing led to another, and now we are working with the biggest names in the architectural field, Zaha Hadid Architects, Norman Foster, Santiago Calatrava, and so on. But uh, it was really a lesson that uh, you, you have to, to start somewhere, and you can just aim for the highest possible um, clients. You, you, just, you just have to build it up to snowball it. And the photos I'm showing here are really from our team buildings around the world, uh, showing the small studio from 20, 30 people expanded to over 100 people. Now we are close to 200 with uh, offices in London, Dubai, here in Sofia, our main one, Belgrade. And it's we have colleagues from all over the world working. And not only that we started working with the bigger clients, but they are addressing us by our first name they're collaborating with us as we're on the same team and this is really a blessing because as i mentioned um, a lot of my colleagues have architectural degree i don't i i come from economics and before that from electronics and uh, it, it's really a blessing that i got to work with all these people to know to know them to contact on daily basis and they write, write thankful letters to us that they really feel like we're in the same loop and uh, we're, we're part of the same process. Uh, this slide I wanted to make uh, as a separate, just the photo with uh, Santiago Calatrava, one of the most popular and biggest architectural names of the modern architecture. Uh, we had a project coming up and we had to come to Switzerland to film some on-site uh, shots, both in his office, in his house. He had this aura of the great professionalist and you can just feel the respect everyone from his company had around him. And uh, later on, we went to his house and once we finished the shots, he showed us throughout his house with arts that are one on the behinds, that all his work, sculptures, drawings, and he invited us for a casual talk after we were done everything related to the project. And as we were talking like for an hour or two with him, it was me and uh, another colleague from the company. I was really, I, I, I just couldn't uh, realize the, the surreal situation I'm in because when I started with render tests during the night, crashing everyone saying you should stick to marketing, you should drop it. It's not good. It's not going anywhere. That I, I got to meet one of the biggest architects in his house to discuss, to have a friendly chat. And it, it's to do this day. It's uh, still, a, still a blessing for me. Dubai is a very large part of our company's um, field of work. Uh, a lot of our projects are focused uh, in the Middle East and especially Dubai. The image you see in the back uh, currently behind me is from one of the biggest master plans in the world, Dubai Creek Harbor. Uh, I'm not uh, there uh, currently. I'm in Sofia, that's just the render. Um, here on the left, I'm with my boss attending the Dubai Expo. And uh, Dimitar was always been a mentor like a boss slash friend to me because had he not brought me to Sofia and had he not told me to be brave and take my chances, I would probably be in some other place, some other career. And now that this career got me to Dubai to travel, to make photo shoots there, to meet the clients we're working with. And as I say, the same team 
I meant that once you meet the people you're working with, because most of the for most of the part in Arcvis, it's mostly phones and emails. But once you meet them, once you see the real people that are uh, with have positive attitude, they they are not here just to give you more and more comments, just to torture you. They they just want to make a collaborating process to get the best possible because. Um, it really things put things into perspective that uh, when you see a building that you work with is right there in front of your eyes, high towers, hundreds of meters. When you see that, when you think that maybe a material change you proposed might affect the whole building appearance, it, it just, okay, you're not the main architect. You're not the one that you're signing behind the, uh, under the contract, but you still have some touch there that stays forever. This building will stay there forever. And as someone who is not an architect, it's really a blessing for me and uh, truly cherish that process. And yeah, my last slide, uh, appreciate the craft. I just put uh, drone photos because I wanted to, to say that you have to explore, that you don't have to be focused in one single thing, that the thing that I'm working 3D full time doesn't mean uh, you can't explore other passions. On the left, the, is my first drone photo when I bought my, my drone back in five years ago. And the one with the night shot is the same place, National Palace of Culture in Sofia, but during the night, much more advanced. And this is just my hobby. So the fact that I have a full time in 3D doesn't mean I can't have a hobby that I can get better with. And on the right where it says Bulgaria, it's uh, from a, one of the biggest expos in Europe for architecture and real estate. And the people presenting the Bulgarian uh, booth uh, contacted me and wanted to buy this photo without me ever promoting my drone photos. And this is, this is not some plug. Uh, this is just to, to show that you, you can always explore. The fact that you spent many years in something doesn't mean you can't also diverse that you, you, you can also if you're in a company or, or if you're even not in a company, if you're freelance, the more you can do, the more you can offer on the table, it makes you harder to replace. The, if, you're, if you're just a one-trick pony, okay, if you're super good at it, that's great. But if something happens, if the market crashes, if you have to find something else, you don't have any other skills, that is a really um, a possibility uh, some people might want to consider and always have that uh, side quest, I might say, that uh, might save them one day. It's not that I'm thinking about quitting. It's just uh, just never stop exploring. But the main passion, you just got to find it. And for me, that is 3D for more than 10 years. You just, you, you, you know, I'm finished with this. Uh, life is really too short. It's really a cliche. But life is really too short to spend it on a job that you don't like, that you hate going in the morning. And it, if it doesn't get you through the day, it's, it's really not worth. Just find your passion. Back in the day, my girlfriend told me, OK, I'm graduating in architecture. I'm starting a job. And I have some colleagues that are waitresses and that are making more money than me. I said, it's not about who is making more money now. You can make money with everything. But you have to be, when you wake up, and when you go to bed uh, in the evening, you, you have to be with ease with yourself at peace, that you're doing something you like. Because one day, like 50 years from now, if you go back and just see you spent most of your time because your job is where you will, spoil, you will spend most of your time during the day with these people on that place. If, if it's something you hate it, it's not really worth it. It's not all about the money. It's, you, have, you just have to find your passion. And I, I'd love to close with that. I don't want to bore you anymore. I hope it was uh, interesting for you. I hope uh, people can take something from this talk. And I thank to Nick Wassenhaus for this great opportunity. Anything uh, you want to contact, just go to redvertex.com. You can contact uh, our company there. We have an academy that is, we have an idea to start to become international. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, office in, offices in different companies. So if, you're, if you want to pursue a career in a 3D company, you can always contact us. Cheers. Thank you so much, Ivalo.
It's uh, yeah, just like uh, Kalina actually wrote as well. It's uh, really cool to see someone getting into this industry and starting from a completely different background than maybe the the usual uh, kind of story, which obviously some of us uh, are um, are maybe a, a bit more uh, representing in 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 that direction. Um, which is as actually one of the questions I want to bring up later on as well. Uh, I think just before we do that, we want to get um, over to Davide's um, presentation. Uh, Davide is, just give me two seconds here. Uh, Davide uh, Paolini is the founder at 3D Graphic Academy. And um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here at for the live show, but he did make a presentation for us, which I think that we should just get on with. So. Here is Davido. Hi everyone, thank you for your introduction and many thanks to the Chaos team for inviting me to present in front of this community. Okay. Today I'm gonna show you the container side and the inner side. An ArcVis workflow using SketchUp and V-Ray. Also, I think you'll appreciate two examples extracted from the masterclass I created. The first one is the visualization of an office building in a urban area. And the next one is an interior design project. Both the examples are created in SketchUp and rendered with V-Ray. Okay, let's get started. Since I founded 3D Graphic Academy many years ago, I noticed that uh, a common mistake of an ArcVis beginner is to pay attention to the subject and not to the surrounding. I used this picture of Jeffrey Zoon, a photographer, in an ironically way to explain to you that often the rendering of a beginner is like this image, a super detailed subject in a non-detailed surrounding, probably added in Photoshop, like the birds. So romantic. I don't hate the birds, but I think there are more birds in the ArcVid universe than in real life. <laughs> Other times, the render is uh, just an architecture in the void, but with funny clouds in the sky. So I decided to explain to my student that uh, a project is uh, like this picture. It is composed by a container side and by an inner side. And you have to pay attention in modeling and rendering both sides. As a matter of fact, firstly, we need to create, model and render the container side that in this case is the surrounding and in a separate file we will model and render the inner side, the architecture. This way our work can be more fast and accurate. Once we made the two separate sides, we'll put them together and start to shoot like a photographer. Um, a very simple exercise that I usually assign to my student as uh, the, at the master class is uh, Bellezza del Surreale and uh, in English the beauty of surreal. And it consists in rendering a super simple room, but at the same time detailed in modeling and materials. Often a SketchUp user does not pay the same attention to the little detail in modeling like a 3ds Max user. So I need to teach the right way in modeling and the right way in texturing and rendering a simple room. Once the room is completed, I invite the students to choose one of the 3D objects from our gallery or from Chaos Cosmos and put it into the room, like the inner side, trying to do something surreal. This little exercise demonstrates to the student that if both the container side and the inner side of your image are well done and realistic, then all the image will be realistic or in this case surreal. Let me show you some example. There's something creepy. 
something uh, artistic, something gold, and something very Italian, very Italian. Something like just Jeff Koons. And something surreal. Okay. It was a fun exercise. So I'm gonna show you something more serious. It is an example excerpt from Masterclass, the office building. And it refers to the container side the urban area. Here you can see the work in progress images and uh, as you can notice the building is not detailed. It is completely white like a maquette. That's why we have to pay our attention to the surrounding as I said before. There is a lot of noise, imperfection in a urban context and we have to focus on modeling the site and populating it with buildings, 3D assets and more to achieve a realistic result. Now I show you the SketchUp model. Here's the SketchUp model. As you can see the office building is on a hill and the street is not a regular street, it's an irregular one and it is modeled with the a sandbox in, um, a, in a SketchUp. Uh, the other elements, just like the old wall, is uh, modeled with the Artisan, the plugin that I suggest you to model these uh, um, irregular, irregular parts. I show you the geometry. Okay. And the sidewalk, the sidewalk was modeled with the, the <coughs> curve loft this one, Kurvilov plugin, because it generates uh, quad faces, uh, just like uh, uh, Artisan also, but uh, uh, when you use the quad faces, you can use uh, through paint another plugin, this one, uh, that can distort the texture and uh, you can apply the texture and the texture, if you add a geometry with the quads, uh, can follow the sidewalk, okay? It is, uh, it is uh, super fast and uh, it has a good, good result. Now I show you another trick that I use. Uh, this is uh, the zebra crossing. Zebra crossing is um, a copy of a um, a portion of the area of the street. Here you are. Okay, and uh, it is uh, put just a little bit uh, uh, below the street. Uh, you can see it in the SketchUp model. You can see it only in the render because uh, I apply uh, it uh, the displacement tool of V-Ray and uh, so they pop up from uh, the street in, uh, in the final rendering, just uh, uh, like in the, uh, re in the reality they have a little thickness. The buildings, uh, the buildings are only um, um, a simple and low poly uh, modeling from the picture, the picture of the front of the building, okay? Uh, they are very simple, just like uh, modeling, but uh, they do their job. Let me show you in V-Ray. When you are not so near, they, they do their job. I think uh, it's a good technique uh, to use a very light geometry with uh, a big result. During the modeling and the basic rendering of the um, a container side of, of my urban area, I use the uh, real-time uh, V-Ray render mode uh, set with the CUDA. With CUDA, with both uh, CPU, CPU and uh, CPU, uh, I have uh, NVIDIA uh, 36 and a Threadripper by AMD which is very fast mode and uh, try uh, and try and I can try all my view 
in uh, this mode in, in, in a very fast way. Okay, this is the container side. Let's go to see the inner side. Here's the sketch model of the inner side, the office building. And uh, this is very important in the, the workflow because as you can see uh, in, the, in this model, we have only the building. This is a basic scene with the three dome light, which I switch uh, uh, from the other to another one. And I use it because if I switch to V-Ray, you can see that the, uh, the V-Ray mode real time is super, super fast. I also can model and render in real time with V-Ray and not vision or vantage. This is V-Ray, okay? And I can use my material, I can uh, uh, model it, I can, uh, I can use it in a very, very, very super fast way and a very feedback. These materials are uh, not, not uh, uh, simple, uh, many of them are, here we are, this is, are many texture and many shader on the reflection, glossiness and, uh, and uh, dirt, dirt channel, just this, round edges, this is our, this is, is the round, the V-Ray round edges, you can see here, the round and here the round, but in uh, SketchUp uh, you don't have the round edges, okay? This is not simple material, but as you can see, if, uh, in, the, in the model there is only the building. And if you have only the building and the other, the surrounding, is only an HDR uh, providing the right lightning, uh, just uh, to try the material texture and, uh, and uh, to model your scene, you are very, very fast. And this is the core, this is the core of the workflow. In uh, this mode, you can uh, um, uh, be more detailed and uh, you can be more accurate because you have a very fast uh, uh, feedback with V-Ray and not a ray tracer or a, a, another rendering mode with V-Ray in your scene during your modeling and uh, during setting your project. In this mode also the displacement uh, is super fast. You can see the, the displacement of the pebbles uh, is, is, is really in real time. Okay. <laughs> and once you complete the, the inner side, once you complete the inner side, you put together the container side and the inner side. So here are the final results. It is a detail of the zebra crossing. I just play with the atmosphere with the, another HDR. And I also play it with the building surround. <laughs> so let me introduce the other example where I use this workflow, the interior design. Let's go to the SketchUp model. Um, as you can imagine, the SketchUp model is the first layer of the container side. And the container side uh, for the interior design must be very detailed with the smoothed angles in all the model because the distances uh, are shorter than in the urban uh, surrounding and the detail uh, are um, are much, much important, are more and more important. Okay, this is an example of the, of the model. And, uh, 
and a little trick is uh, that uh, I used to uh, to repeat um, the the similar part to copy one to another one and uh, also in this case you can see the texture here but with the with the the V-Ray randomizer the new V-Ray randomizer in the render they will appear all different so I can go very very fast when I texture and modeling once I finish to model the interior project I render the the container side without the the inner side and uh, so you can see the the rooms here's the bath the dressing room and uh, it is the bedroom studio and the living room and the kitchen Here's the inner side of the living room with the furniture and the in this SketchUp model there is only the furniture and nothing else. In a similar way to the office building uh, scene we have only a, a dome light. In, as a matter of fact if I switch to V-Ray here you can see the HDR as a background and it provides also the lightening of the scene. But in this way, the model is super fast and I can do every change in real time. Okay, here you can see. And once you complete uh, to set up your uh, furniture, uh, you can save it, select uh, all and uh, save uh, for your scene, but only for your scene. Uh, it, um, it could be uh, useful uh, in creating um, a, an asset library. Uh, as a matter of fact, this workflow uh, will increase you much and much more your asset your personal asset library obviously at the end we put together the container side and the inner side here's the final images this is the bathroom and the dressing room in this case the inner side uh, where the dresses, the furniture, in the case of the bedroom, the bed was set in the, the basic uh, scene that we see for the living room, we saw for the living room, this is the studio, and uh, when, you, uh, when you do the, the final render, you have to uh, imagine you like a photographer and walking around the, the house and, uh, uh, and shooting some close-up and uh, some general view. Um, I, I think that um, the, the close-up are more emotional um, and uh, has a sense of tactile, okay? This is a um, 3D scan model uh, imported from uh, Sketchfab. I use um, Sketchfab for the 3D scan model and I usually import it with the, the transmuter plugin for uh, Sketchup. This is the kitchen. and uh, a little variation in the material and in the atmosphere. So, I hope you enjoyed my session and I really hope you can take something to improve your skill with using SketchUp and V-Ray in your everyday work. Again, many thanks to the Chaos team for having me today. Bye!
All right, great. Um, thanks a bunch for uh, Davide for his uh, presentation. And uh, I see there's been quite a few questions for Davide. He, he isn't here, unfortunately. Um, but some of your questions he might be able to answer if you go to his uh, site, just a second, or at uh, 3D Graphic Academy, uh, and probably uh, reach out to him there and uh, see if he can answer some of your uh, specific questions for, uh, for SketchUp and V-Ray and his workflow. Um, just so you um, so you're aware that you might be able to do that. All right. So that actually concludes all of our speakers. Um, we've had quite a few uh, interesting questions, so I actually uh, love to uh, start bringing some of those up. Um, the first one I want to bring up is the uh, was a question about the pros and cons of studying 3D in an university, and if you can learn it all on your own. Um, I'll start with a short answer to the last part of it. And I'm saying this as a teacher at a school doing 3D. Yes, you can definitely do learn it on your own. However, because um, there's no actual short answer to this, um, I am a firm believer of having a mentor of some sort, whether it being through an actual school or through an online program or finding a mentor, even through other platforms like Chaos Campus, for example, on uh, Facebook or even ArtStation or Rookies or wherever you might get in contact with someone, that would definitely be a benefit regardless of how you do it. Um, I do have quite a few opinions on the learning on your own and what that entails, um, but I'd actually like to throw it over to uh, some of you guys, um, if any of you have any, um, maybe something to say about the pros and cons of studying 3D at, for example, a university, because I know some of you actually did that. And some of you probably didn't. I know Evaluate didn't for sure. So does any of you have any uh, opinions on that? Jake? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I completely agree with the, the mentor thing. You can certainly um, learn all of the workflow online. Um, but yeah, you, you need someone to ask questions. Um, and that could even be like attending conferences, meetups, but meeting people in person. And I think that's what uni is really about is like the people you study with at university, they're going to kind of be present throughout your whole career. And they're going to be at other companies um, and you can always reach out to them. So it's a real good opportunity to network. Um, and as I said in my talk, like people hire people. And if you study together um, and you're ever looking for work, then you can always just shout at some of your, your old classmates. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Evalio, I know you came into the industry from a different direction than, you know, probably most people uh, here or at least most of the speakers here. So what is your... Do you have any pros and cons into uh, the studying of 3D through a university or a school? Um, or do you do you see it as a benefit that you didn't, for example? Um, from my point of view, um, it definitely has pros and cons. Uh, as someone who went back and forth through tutorials, through trial and error, um, now that, as I mentioned, we have this Red Vertex Academy here, uh, I have uh, even been uh, a teacher in some of them. And we have this specific course made for ArcVis. So people come here and take the course. Uh, it's, a, it's a paid course. And some of them later on decide uh, if they want to stay here and continue working, if both parties are OK with it. And uh, as someone who is uh, a teacher in that, uh, I can say if you find a course or if it's several months or if it's a university degree, it's definitely very, very helpful because it has all the specific in information summed up and uh, you don't go left and right and see if that's working or not. Um, I, for the ArcVis, in, ArcVis industry, I can definitely say, uh, or for any specific area, if you find a course that is specified in that area and that field, I, I definitely recommend that you, you can go for it. You know, there are all those people that sign up for 
any classes that just to get uh, another diploma if but uh, if you don't need it just don't do it you don't need those diplomas the diploma is not going to make your render for you if you don't have the passion if you don't have the drive the diploma is just something to to back it up but in the end uh, you you just got uh, to put on to put in the work yeah yeah I, i definitely agree and there's also this common maybe a little bit of a misconception with what what does it mean to actually um learn 3d on your own are you ever actually doing that on your own because using youtube and so on isn't actually learning something on your own you're just searching for the content yourself instead of having a mentor pointing you in the specific direction so in theory i think almost nobody learns 3d on their own completely um they have some sort of mentoring through random YouTube channels or or online content, free content, whatever they, they actually do. And it is definitely possible. It's It just takes that much more discipline when in fact, even taking the shortcut through an, a university or a school or online classes or whatever is in itself very demanding to your discipline as well. Um, and there is also this one very big caveat that if you search for your tutorials, for example, on YouTube on your own. And I'm kind of addressing a little bit to Bennett and Jake here because they also do um, um, YouTube content and so on with tutorials and all these kind of things uh, like I do myself as well. And that is the fear for me as a content creator to put something out on YouTube that is either outdated or, or straight up wrong as a thing of learning others. I don't know if, if I'm the only one here with that fear, but I've actually, I'd love to hear from you, Bennett, on when you try and teach someone something, like you, you create a video about a subject, do you ever think, how much time do you actually spend thinking through, is this the actual right way for me to tell people how to work with this? Or is this uh, old information, outdated information and so on? Oh man, that's a, that's a constant struggle. Is my mic working? Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah, no, honestly, um, there has been times where I have uploaded like contents and got some, like a lot of negative comments and I totally understand that perspective. Um, and, uh, yeah, I definitely think through like multiple times. Sometimes I record my tutorial several times until I get it like just right. But even after that, sometimes like I realize I've deliver the wrong information and uh, I might be misguiding people. So sometimes I do like a post editing, like after you upload. Another thing is that YouTube is also smart enough that they don't recommend videos that are not good. And if it receives like enough negative comments or like uh, dislikes, then it automatically gets filtered out. So um, in a way I'm concerned, but at the same time, I am not too concerned either at the same time try to be, I think on YouTube side, it's more about like being transparent and showing my process of getting to the results. So um, yeah, and it's also free. So as opposed to like a paid curriculum, I think there's uh, a lot less burden on that front. Yeah, for sure. I think the hardest part is for the viewer, especially if, if you're a new uh, person into 3D in any sort of way, doesn't matter if it's Max V-Ray or even mentor ray i think someone mentioned at some point <laughs> um it the problem the main problem with having a platform like youtube is that anyone can create a video for youtube and god knows that i've seen quite a few videos being on youtube which probably shouldn't be there as in people trying to teach others something about a subject that they clearly actually don't know much about. They learned it somehow and that's fine, but they might not be aware of the fact that they, the, the thing that they're trying to teach others is outdated by five years. It's an old workflow or whatever. So it's not wrong per se, but it's definitely outdated. And that, you know, the new viewers can't necessarily know if this is bad to, to learn. In, as in it's not current knowledge or whatever. Um, I've, I recently I saw a, a V-Ray YouTube tutorial from, I don't know, some random channel, it doesn't matter. And the, the tutorial itself was actually great, but the person was using very old ways of using V-Ray, pre-V-Ray Next actually, which made it, you know, 
someone seeing this wouldn't be able to know this. So how much do you think about stuff like this, uh, Jake, when you create for um, Corona, for example? Obviously, for the team itself, you probably get it reviewed or something, but yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I think going back as well to the university thing is, and, and this YouTube is like the structure. Um, and when, certainly when I was starting out, it was very much like do things, break it, find the answer. And you're, and you're just pulling information from all over. And I kind of lack that structure. And that's where I think a course or a university will actually go do this, 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 and this. Um, and they're all going to be up to date. Whereas if you're pulling stuff from like, you might end up with like V-Ray free stuff plus some like old Max thing. And it's all just going to mash up and it's going to, I don't know what it will, it will create, you know? Um, so I think structure is what um, they provide. And I think that is actually lacking on YouTube. Maybe playlists is a good way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so there's actually a, a fun little question here that we might as well bring up as well is because um, some of you, I think Jake and John and Ivalio especially mentioned uh, when going back in time, having older computers, older software that renders took a long time. Uh, some of us was joking in the chat earlier as well um, about, you know, reminiscing old, old memories about way too long render times. Um, but does any... So basically, how important is a, a, having a good computer now to use the software that we actually have? Does any of you have any input on, on that matter, in, especially if we compare it to in the old days and the old days being in tech, so five, ten years ago? I'm not being paid to say this, but um, Chaos Cloud is just so, so, so good. Um, that's, that's what I use. I mean, for a long time, I just worked on a laptop as I was traveling a lot and used Dropbox and um, the cloud. And that worked great for me. Yeah. Um, I think one of the key things that got, um, that has changed a lot through, through the years is one thing is the hardware available. Well, it's not really available right now, but the hardware that should be available right now um, is in theory, cheaper, so that even the cheaper versions of graphics cards and CPUs and so on is still a lot faster than they used to be. Um, so you get a, a lot more for your money, um, but also the software, V-Ray and all of these kind of softwares is getting a lot faster with whatever resources you actually have. So you don't necessarily need a really good expensive computer to, in order to do 3D, I believe, but it's definitely a help having at least a, you know, comparable hardware to whatever you're trying to create. Um, but some projects don't really need that many resources, while other projects, I'm pretty sure uh, some of the projects Evalio showed, probably needed quite a few resources in order to actually ever compute at any point, even RAM or whatever, right? Yeah, and uh, definitely so. Uh, we have our own render farm. But uh, if I if I go more into the again philosophical approach of things, uh, uh, if I make a comparison, like Bennett is a YouTube creator, I'm sure he knows uh, when watching uh, maybe even comments on his videos and on other vloggers, a lot of people are asking what camera are you using, what lens you're using. Uh, but uh, and this famous guy Casey Neistat, he's always saying it, it doesn't matter. The technology doesn't matter if you don't have a good idea, if you don't have good composition, good knowledge. Even with the greatest camera, you won't get uh, good results. It, it's same with 3D. Uh, you have to get at least some basic computer um, hardware. You, you can't uh, use something very old. But uh, people need to understand if they're starting up now, they shouldn't spend all their fortune on a new computer. Just see how it is with maybe an older uh, workstation and, and if it, that's your thing of course the better graphic cards and the more processors of course it's easier for everyone yeah for sure um and jake mentioned uh, chaos cloud which is actually a really good mention as well because then it doesn't really matter what computer you're on obviously you need to have enough to show whatever you're doing on your computer without rendering um, but you can actually, you do actually get free credits for uh, Chaos Cloud. I think, is it 20 credits maybe for free when you sign up? Yeah. 
Um, so it's a good way to try it out and see if that works for you, if that workflow is is great for uh, for people or not. Um, and I've used it myself quite a bit as well, and it it is very smooth to actually use. So yeah, uh, Chaos didn't even want they didn't tell us to mention this, but it is actually something that some of us uh, use quite a bit. Um, so just want to pitch that in. Um, all right, so there is uh, this question about if you think a diploma is leveraging your application when looking for a job or the portfolio or is the portfolio the key? Should you have a showreel, you know, all of these these different things? What what gives a job in the end, I guess? Maybe uh, Bennett, you have something to... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, no, we'd love to. Yeah, uh, this is just my two cents, but um, I'm definitely on the side that the portfolio is the crux of job application, mostly because it is your value prop, right? The reason you're getting hired is so that you can provide equal or greater value to the company that your wages paid. So if you could prove that you could do that, um, I think that is the best way to do it. Um, like your education is a good benchmark for a lot of disciplines. But especially when it comes to visual discipline, I feel like portfolio takes a bigger weight. I'm sure, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks like Evaluate agrees as well. Uh, um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely also say that, you know, having a, you know, in, in the end, your portfolio is, is the way, is the gateway to your job usually. Uh, a diploma might help. It might give a company uh, when they're looking at your curriculum, an idea of what you should be able to do, um, depending on if it's a school or online course or whatever. Um, it, if it's known to some degree, it might be, you know, it might give a hint at, as to what kind of knowledge you at least have been exposed to and what kind of people have, you know, taught you anything. Um, but it is uh, definitely in the end, it's the portfolio people usually look at the most um, and also a great way to start networking and, and doing all of these great things that, um, you know, almost all of you guys have talked about today. So, yeah, it's definitely a thing. Um, so, Ivalo, there's actually a question specifically for you here. Do you really have to do freelancing after school or just apply to work for a firm for better experience? Um, actually, uh, for me and uh, what I experienced, um, they, they have nothing in common. You're still making a 3D render, but uh, it, it's really different. I don't think if I didn't make those freelance uh, gigs and offers and clients that I found through them, for me specifically, it, it wouldn't change the course. But uh, looking back at any decision in my life, it may sound cliche, but I wouldn't change anything because... Uh, you know, the butterfly effect, you change one thing, 10 years from now, something else happens in a different way. So I did it that way. I tried it. Um, it's not that, that I didn't like it, but other opportunities presented themselves. So I just I just took them. But some people I know in all kinds of spheres, I have friends that are drone photographers and they're just doing all that they're just freelancers they they have offers and they just go and do it same with 3d same with everything um it really depends now with each year the the scene is getting more and more competitive it's very much as there are many tutorials it's easier to learn but that applies to everyone so everyone can become a great artist in no time so when you go to all these freelance websites and uh, a client proposes an offer, you see just hundreds of people like you. So you need to have that into account. It is great to find a client that you can work on a regular basis with him or her. But uh, yeah, for me, for me, it, it wasn't a turning point that I made like three or four freelance projects. It just was, it was the idea to see that I can do money with that, to believe in myself, and it was again more on the on the mind part of things, not so much in the technical or in the connection field. All right. So um, 
A person asked, um, and I think this was directed at Jake and John. I actually think I want to hear John's take on this, at least to begin with. Uh, Jake might have something uh, clever to say as well. Um, but a person asked, uh, you both seem to experiment a lot with your work. Is it all due to an endless source of inspiration or do you look up for reference visuals and so on? Um, for me, I, I, I kind of get inspiration from dreams. And I feel like we're so lucky because we dream about stuff and we can actually go away and if we remember them, turn them into like physical spaces and, and work things out. So most of my ideas come from dreaming and, you know, obviously I take reference and inspiration from many things, artists, uh, you know, uh, creatives and designers or like constantly. Um, but a lot of the ideas I actually go and try and uh, create our dreams or based uh, inspiration. Um, so I, I suggest that if you have an idea, just try and go away and sketch it out, turn it into 3D, test colors, test lighting, and then eventually start making some artwork and hopefully that pushes you in the direction of what, you know, what you enjoy making. And so a lot of the stuff I come up with it doesn't see the light of day because it's just terrible and that's fine, you know, because it's helped me get to where I wanted to see the light of day. Um, so just try and work it and work it until I'm happy with something. Cool. What about you, Jake? Do you dream about your next 3D project or do you get your inspiration from somewhere else? No, I've, I've got quite a backlog, but I do think it's awesome that we have this skill set to like um, to see something visual and then create it. I think that's um, one of the best things about 3D and it doesn't matter how like detailed it is. Um, but yeah, there's definitely I've got plenty, plenty to do. It's not like I run out of inspiration or like, oh, what should we make? I do believe that there is this, for me at least, there was this kind of irony thing where when I wasn't great at making 3D, when I, when I was very new in the business and trying to learn how to do 3D and use whatever render engine was available at the time and, and so on, I had, I felt like at least I had a million ideas as to what I wanted to create. But now as I've basically gained at least enough knowledge for, for it to just be, well, there's not really any object I look at anymore where I think I don't know how to do this. Um, I have an idea of how to approach almost, you know, most challenges I get, but now I don't have as many ideas because probably I, I don't know, I somehow I lost them on the way. So the thing I do a lot is I use Pinterest and Instagram a lot. Uh, just lurking other projects, following a lot of channels and just getting a feed of inspiration just coming at me. So usually every day, at, at least once a day, I log into my Instagram account through my phone and, and just look through whatever's getting presented to me. And I use that as inspiration. I actually do screenshot a lot on my phone and put it in a folder just to get the thumbnails later on to get inspiration as to what next project I should try and work on for my own personal projects, at least. Uh, client projects is a bit different because usually they have you know, something specific in mind mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, but it depends on the kind of jobs you do, obviously. Does any of you, uh, Ivalio or Bennett, do you, any of you do something different in terms of inspiration? Or is it more the same kind of vibe? Yeah, I think when it comes to inspirations, um, yeah, I, I tend to look at a lot of references. Um, but I, I, in order to create something a little bit more original, I try to go cross platform or subject. So for example, if I'm designing for architecture, I try to draw inspiration from concept art or um, photography, for example. And um, if I were to do vice versa, I would say like, if I were to create a concept art, maybe I'll look at architecture or yeah, like other subject matters. Um, for, for me personally, uh, I really love to observe the environment around us, um, especially in the 3D part when uh, trying to go for more photorealistic uh, renders. Uh, you have to see how the different finishes, the different materials connect with the light, how they absorb the light, how they reflect it. And uh, in terms of ideas, I remember this um, ad in a magazine that it said, uh, when, when some people see a fishbone, uh, other people see architecture. And it was this, this picture of bones from a fish 
And next to it, it was a really modern building with the same type of uh, wireframe structure. So the inspiration is everywhere around us, especially in the art, it's just unlimited. Yeah, I think you see, we see a lot of examples in other businesses as well. When you look at uh, movies in the VFX business, for example, that people actually look a lot uh, on like insects for design for spaceships. And, you know, people look at all different kinds of ways they can gather inspiration for any design concept. And it doesn't matter if it's Aquavis or if it's uh, VFX you're doing or whatever. Um, get something that interests you and and draw inspiration from that into your own next piece or whatever it could be. Uh, for me personally as well, I have a lot of photographers I, I follow, which play a lot with lighting and so on. And that's my way of getting inspired. But I really do think that's more of a personal thing as to what interests you and how to gather this, uh, all of these uh, inspirations. So yeah. Um, let's see here if we have any more. Uh, someone asked if it's uh, when when presenting a portfolio, if it should be an, a website based portfolio or a printed portfolio, which I think is an interesting question when it comes to Aquis, especially. Ivalio, do you have any uh, concerns here? Because you're in you're kind of in the biggest of the companies uh, here represented, I think. Uh, yeah, we we had the. Uh people that apply here for a job that some of them were bringing um, printed versions of their portfolio. I don't mean just uh, a regular uh, white sheet with just the CV. I mean the portfolio printed and presented as it should be. And it, uh, for me personally, uh, when we were discussing with colleagues, uh, it, it really makes uh, a great first impression. It means this person has a has a soul for the design, has love for the design, and this person is serious, and this person wants to present himself or herself in the best possible way. So for me personally, uh, as someone who works in the company and people are coming here and applying for a job and so on, of course, it is the 21st century, and uh, we have to take advantage of the, all the digital possibilities when you're uh, applying for a job that you can send it, if it be a PDF file or video file or your own website. But as I wrote in the chat, uh, if you go on place and you, if you have some nice things to show as in terms of portfolio, even take a, a, a ready template and just put in the renders, it really makes a, a great impression from my point of view. Maybe John, do you have any other preferences, or is it more of the same? Or um, I would, I, I'm kind of like the opposite. I kind of prefer a digital format. Um, I think I wasted a lot of paper at uni printing off my portfolio many times and presenting, and I always felt pretty awful for doing it. Uh, but they, that's what the tutors expected. So I used to always go to interviews and stuff with an iPad um, with a sometimes like a bespoke customized like portfolio for the specific role I was going for uh, so I always just you know put the type of images and stuff per pdf um that like directed at the individual um targeted companies I wanted to work for hoping that they'd be like oh there's there's something in this and it's not just like random loads of images that I've done in the past it's like oh, actually I can see this guy sitting or being a part of the team creating this type of work um, and plus that way you can show animations and stuff quite see seamlessly as well. Um, and I would always try and show kind of show reels and music and stuff. Um, so then by having just one platform, for me, it just felt quite, quite easy. Um, alternatively, I, I think before I even had an iPad, I, I brought on USB and asked to plug it into a computer. Um, and I, I know about the, I understand what you're, you're saying about the professionalism, but I think as long as you have something prepared and you're confident in what you're sharing, and you're, you're enthusiastic about what you're trying to tell and show, I think that's more important and, and you're proud of the work you've achieved and you've put into it. Um, I think that for me is key in, in terms of any sort of portfolio. I wanna see enthusiasm when someone's explaining why they've done things or what they've done and, and how they've been a part of the team. And that, that for me is absolutely key as opposed to what it's presented on. Maybe. Yeah. I think it's great to hear that there are different sides of the same page, basically, as into in terms of what 
what people prefer when presented to a with a portfolio. In some cases, and I think you you in order to to actually get a, a real answer, if if I might be so bold, <laughs> um, would be to actually explore as to who are you presenting your portfolio to, because some companies might actually prefer or there might be a higher chance that they would prefer a printed version versus other companies being more digital. Uh, I would look at how formal maybe the company might present itself. Uh, the more formal, the more I would in, be entitled to do uh, or the more I would uh, think about doing a printed version versus a dig digital version if they're a bit more old school uh, or seem like they're a bit more old school depending you know or if they're a young studio which are you know doing crazy things or whatever i would probably keep it more digital because that might be something they would be looking more for um but it's you know you, you can you know it's a it's a personal preference as well um, which re actually reminded me, or John, you reminded me about the fact that one of the things that I'd like actually like to, to just say is if one of the skills you actually need to learn, as, and I'm talking to everyone here, <laughs> one of the things that people need to learn more when they're new in the industry is self-confidence. It is one of the things I see lack more and more in new students going into 3D is believing in themselves and actually believing how good they are. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons might be because how fast everything is evolving. People are faster getting better. So you could easily go onto the front page of ArtStation or whatever and and really just think really bad of yourself because of all of the amazing projects being on that front page. Um, but you really need to gather self-confidence and, and believe in yourself because, you know, if, if you're going to sell yourself to a company or even a client or whatever, it doesn't matter if you're freelance or looking for a job, the biggest thing is that you need to, you know, at least convince yourself that you're the right person for the client or the job or whatever it is. Um, otherwise, why should they think that you're the right person if you don't even think it yourself? So I think that's really one of the main things that I see people need to work a little bit more on in general. Um, you can never, you can never get into too much self-confidence. You probably can, but you know, it's, it's definitely a thing that would be a, a good practice for a lot of people. Um, the more digital we get, the more YouTube we watch and so on, we, we maybe lose a little bit about the, the connection with people and actually trying to sell ourselves. Uh, so that might be a, a good topic for a, for a different day on how to do that. All right. Uh, I think we actually came through most of the questions. There is this one question. That, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have a good answer for this. How can you get known fast for beginners? What's the easiest and fastest way to get exposure and get get people to notice you? <laughs> any of you have any ideas? Yeah, get on the phone and just call everyone, 10 by 10. <laughs> yeah. Bennett? Yeah, I feel like it depends on what your intents are. If you want, if you just want to get a job, I feel like cold calling might be the fastest way. Or I mean there are better ways presented today, but um, but if you just want to get gain like traction on uh, social media or something like that, I'll just say you either you have to stand out somehow, right? Have have something special about you and just really put it out there. Maybe you can do that by sheer quality of your work. Maybe your work is just so good or so original that everyone just wants to see what comes next and they'll start following you and like become fans. Other things you could do is uh, you could try providing values to them for free, like it just share what you know. And um, it could be in the form of entertainment, it can be in the form of information or something like that. Uh, yeah, there could be e e two easiest ways I think one could start gaining traction. Yeah, yeah, G get yourself noticed. And in, in a way as in go into online forums, either on Facebook, Chaos Campus, uh, Discord groups, and all of these kind of things, be active. The people I remember the most right now, which which are new in the industry, so they don't have actually that much 3D or renders to share, but I notice them if they're active and asking questions and giving advice and and whatever. I mean, I think that's a good, a good way to actually get noticed because 
you know, I think a lot of people in this in our industry might be a little bit shy. So if you're doing a, an extra step to actually get noticed by just being part of a conversation, that might actually do a lot. And as Bennett said, like with quality, you can either be go for quality or um, just post every day and be consistent. Like I've seen a lot of people use that and they just post daily. Um, and then you're just going to build up this body of work and you're going to get better and better quality as you go. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. All right. I actually think we came, we were through most of the questions or at least all of the ones I can find here. So um, I would actually just like to say thank you to all the amazing speakers for joining us and joining me. In, so I wouldn't be alone in this show. That would be terrible. Um, and thank you for all the amazing talks and yeah, and all the uh, great information. It's been great. Other than that, I don't think we have anything more on our schedule. Um, the talks, yeah, as uh, the KS client is saying that uh, these, these talks will get on YouTube as well later on. So make sure to look for them or share them with your friends if you think these talks were amazing. Great. So thank you and see you later. <laughs>